On today's show, art inspired by water, all hanging at the Minnesota Marine Art Museum, nestled in Winona, Minnesota. And you may have heard of some of the artists. Next, when spring comes to Lake Osakis, witness a special bird. Lots of turkeys roam in Minnesota these days, but it wasn't always the case. The story of the comeback of wild turkeys. That was a good one. And finally, the book is called Last Child in the Woods. The name, unfortunately, says it all. What happens when kids prefer indoors to outdoors? We'll visit with the author. Those stories and more next. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi, everybody. Raven and I welcome you to the show. You know, we all know we like our water, we like our lakes, we like our boats here in Minnesota. Well, guess what? In Winona, Minnesota, it all goes on the wall as a beautiful painting. <laughs> Sometimes surprises show up in the dangdest places, like here in Winona, Minnesota, where, of all things, there's a marine art museum that's, well, full of surprises. Such as, what's an original Picasso doing here? We have, we have two Pablo Picassos, uh, two Claude Monets, and also two Henri Matisse's. Famed historic original paintings just hanging here along the banks of the Mississippi River. But if you kind of look around, you might notice a theme. Our tagline is really great art inspired by water. So we look at the ongoing human relationship with water. Great art inspired by water is a very open concept for us to work within. So a lot of our paintings have bodies of water in them. They are painted by artists who have a strong relationship with water. Minnesota has over 90,000 miles of shoreline. We are the land of 10,000 lakes. Water is a super important part of our lives. The quality and, the, and the, the names that we have in this building you would expect to see in a much larger city. Well, let's take a look around. If you know nothing about art, you will recognize names like Claude Monet, Vincent van Gogh, John James Audubon. One of our most important American paintings is by John James Audubon, whose namesake is the Audubon Bird Society. He is best known for his large prints, his watercolors. He did very few oil paintings in his life. In this particular painting, you can really see and feel that this bird is alive and protecting its prey. It's meant to be the Mississippi River, and it's a perfect home for it here at this museum on the river. America's first president is also on the wall. This painting from 1851 by a German artist named Emanuel Leutze is one of the most iconic, well-known American scenes in the history of art and in American history. It is, of course, Washington crossing the Delaware. We are very fortunate to have a smaller version that he did simultaneously as they did the larger version that is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We have a very important one from the 1860s by an artist named Alfred Britcher. When it came up on auction a few years ago, they asked both the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota, do you recognize this? Well, within two minutes, the people from Wisconsin said, oh, that's Winona, that's Trempola Mountain. Winona surprises us more than, more than not. I mean, you look at the summer, the great festivals that are here, and then and you come to this wonderful art museum, and. Yeah, uh, they've got some good ideas here in Monona. Indeed, this good idea, a marine art museum, loaded up, been up. 
The museum itself was founded by a group of local business people who were interested in finding a home for a very large river barge that was in the process of being decommissioned, be, you know, being retired. But from there, it grew to include uh, some other people who were collecting art with a water-based theme. And then from that, we decided to go with just a museum centered around art inspired by water. It's about water and, and our relationship with nature. So you've never seen a Matisse, huh? No, no. The majority of our visitors are jaws on the floor. So the next time you're in Winona and you step into this marine art museum, be prepared. Shock and awe. Just don't act surprised. When we return, it's spring, so let the dancing begin. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Alumacraft. Radco Truck Accessories. And by Kinetico. Coming up, one of the greatest spring shows in Minnesota. It's the courtship dances of the Western Grebe. The Western what? Yeah, you can find them every spring on Lake Osakis. We went there. And it goes, it's way out here. So what we're witnessing right now is the birds are, are feeding. Wow. Did you see that one that was right over here a second ago? Holy cow. Yeah. That was amazing. My first Western Grieve sighting. I can't believe it. This is the first for me, and I'm just so excited. Excited? Understandable. Quick, snap a picture. For Eileen Sabus of Minneapolis, an amateur wildlife photographer, the bird in her viewfinder is not only an interesting subject, it's a rare Minnesota sight the Western Grieve. And that's the noise you make? Yes. <laughs> Never heard of the bird? Understandable. As its name implies, this grebe species is common in America's West, but very uncommon in Minnesota, except here on Lake Osakis, which attracts the state's largest concentration of these Western visitors. When I first came up here in 1999, it was in the fall, I did some fishing, and there was a bunch of them, and I, I was just intrigued their activity and their how smart they are, and, and I've been hooked ever since. So hooked on grebes, Jim Snyder and his wife Bunny offer pontoon tours for bird lovers interested in this quirk of nature. That's when springtime inspires western grebes to return to Lake Osakis from their coastal wintering grounds out west. There's a nice adult pair right there. One just dove. Two just dove. It's funny how it, it's quiet and all of a sudden everybody gets busy. For birds, spring is always a busy time, of course. Time for the mating game. The game that inspires one of nature's most awesome moments, the courtship dance of the Western Grebe. <laughs> When you see it, you you always remember it. And when the mating dance is over, and this is one of their favorite nesting spots. And when the moment is right, and uh, tourists are invited to uh, watch from the Osakis observation deck. This is a good spot to see grapes. Osakis is proud of its feathered tourist attraction. The mayor proclaimed this will be the official Minnesota home of the Western Grape. As the days of October grow short, these unique birds will eventually leave Osakis and head for warmer haunts. In the meantime, 
It's almost like they practice, practice waving goodbye. Closed captioning is brought to you by Minnesota Rebat. Hey anglers, it's time for the annual Minnesota Bound Crappie Fishing Contest Saturday, May 5th on Lake Minnetonka. Grand prize in a Lumacraft boat, motor, and trader. You must enter to win. Details online at mnbound.com or at participating Mills Fleet Farm stores. Fish on! Coming up, one of my favorite topics, all about wild turkeys. It's a great conservation story, especially here in Minnesota. Bill Shirk has that story. Should we go set up? Okay. Opportunity sometimes comes in the funniest forms. I hope we get a turkey, Dad. Like this first time turkey hunt slash camping trip for a seven-year-old. It's all a matter of nature. An adventure born solely because of Minnesota's ever-expanding population of wild turkeys. It's super cool. That's my son, Brady. And in the morning, we hope to see a turkey or two Awesome. Or three. Working out great. On this piece of property, offered up by this guy, Minnesota farmer Glenn Steberg. Sure the fertilizer comes out. A man with a passion for farming and a guy who long ago learned to appreciate turkeys. Glenn remembers wandering around the family farm as a kid. One day, he finally saw tracks in the mud. And then after that, they, they pretty much just exploded. That was back in the 70s when Minnesota's turkey population was all but gone. See, way back, turn of the century lumberjacks and hunters wiped out our turkey population. I mean, literally, no birds left. But the hard work of conservationists changed that. Where are we going to release them over in here? A lot of people did a lot of work on that. Certainly the National Wild Turkey Federation deserves a lot of credit. They invested a lot of money and a lot of time. Minnesota's first Wild Turkey Federation chapter started by none other than our own Ron Shera. Now, a healthy population of completely wild turkeys roams much of Minnesota. Got it. Exactly why Brady gets the chance to camp for a few days and hunt turkeys come sunup. Oh my gosh! I can see what it looks like already. It's the fun of settling into the spring woods. Can you give me my, my blanket when you're on the way? Knowing the turkeys, are out there, somewhere. A group of 40 and then a group of 40. And Glenn of 40. seems to know where they are. No, you just see smaller groups all the way around. They could open a season up year round, I think, and it wouldn't hurt them. <laughs> Maybe that's why landowners like Steberg now allow turkey hunters to hunt private property. I just hope Brady might see birds in the morning. Turkeys often act like ghosts. They appear from nowhere and suddenly make sound. I heard a gobble. I can't really do it. It seems the birds do not know you're there. Even so, they don't always get close enough for the right shot. Sometimes, no. Like once in a while. Which is okay in my book. After all, that's not really what these hunts are about. I am together with my son. He always talks to me. He says, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. It's about being outdoors and chasing a bird we now love. They look like giant fat birds. It's the lure 
of Minnesota's wild turkeys. Up next, introducing a kid to the great outdoors has never been so important. The story is next. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by By the Yard Maintenance-Free Outdoor Furniture, Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, Bent Creek Golf Club Eden Prairie, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Alumacraft presents Kids in the Outdoors. It's not often a book makes waves in America, but this one did with a title called Last Child in the Woods. How awful to think. Well, we sat down with the author who explained we have to do something about it, so there is no last child in the woods. Kids playing outdoors in the yard, or sitting in a hunting blind, or on a dock holding a fishing pole. These sights are not as common as they once were. Parents know, we all know. The outdoors as a playground destination has been replaced by game fields, courts and rinks of organized sports, plus in every hand, a smartphone that speaks to the young. Like a San Diego fourth grader once said, I like to play indoors because that's where all the electrical outlets are. Wow, where did that come from? A decade ago, author Richard Louvre heard it and gave it a name, Nature Deficit Disorder, and wrote a book that reverberated with parents and school administrators across America. The book, Last Child in the Woods. And the woods in particular were a special place. We recently sat down and visited with Louvre during a visit to Minnesota. The struggle to bring nature into young lives continues. According to the research now, suggests that kids, most kids, learn a lot better when they're outdoors in nature than they do in a classroom, hour after hour sitting at a desk. The kids do better on standardized testing. That there's some relationship there between the connection to nature and, doing, and, and learning in nature. <laughs> the more high-tech our lives become, the more nature we need. It's a formula, it's an equation. Too. We have to have the balancing agent of nature in our lives the more high-tech we become, and we are going to become more high-tech. Louv insists, however, the choice, staring at a computer or hanging in the woods, doesn't mean one or the other. It's possible for uh, kids to have both a, a, a virtual life in electronics and a real life, a life connected to more of their senses. Lube said he recognizes the nature challenge parents face, especially urban parents. First thing is take them outside yourself. Don't assume that it's, that it's gonna happen by itself. Uh, for one thing, uh, parents, and, and I speak for myself too, when I had young boys, they did not have the kind of free range childhood that I did because I felt fear, as most parents now do, of strangers. Of traffic. The solution, Love said, is parents and nature centers. Where they can learn about nature and then take that information home. They can even look out the window of the car and begin to, begin to perceive what goes past that window in a different way. All of that has to be conscious. Parents taking themselves and their kids outdoors intentionally, as my wife and I did, we made sure we took them fishing. We made sure we took them hiking. And Louvre makes the case that kids who are into the outdoors also are more alive with their senses. When you do go into the natural world, that's the shortcut to feeling fully alive. A common cause for moms, dads, and teachers, leave no child inside. <laughs> Last child in the woods. Now you know why we say, remember to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Sher, of course, always the star of the show as well. Are you listening? Is Raven. Mm -hmm. Yes. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1 800 899 7433. 
get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook. 